Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual Empower meeting. My name is Dalen Miller, and I am the Program Director of Total Health Conferencing. I'm so excited for this meeting, and I thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. Our goal for this meeting is to empower patients and their families with vital information that will help support them through breast cancer diagnosis. Last year, we launched this meeting in Fort Lauderdale and brought over 100 patients, a dozen healthcare providers, and multiple support services together to help us meet this goal. This year has been especially challenging as we all face a pandemic that has fundamentally changed every aspect of our lives. As we navigate COVID-19, breast cancer patients are facing a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety. This meeting will provide a clear communication strategy for patients and physicians. We encourage you to ask questions and chat with one another in the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen. We're very fortunate to have some of the most renowned experts in the field sharing their knowledge and experience. This clinical conversations panel will start with some background and frequently asked questions, and then we'll move into the audience questions, which again, you can ask your questions by typing them into the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen. Our outstanding panelists are Dr. Reshma Matani from the University of Miami, Dr. Elisa Krill Jackson from the University of Miami, Dr. Paranka Grover from Wynn Health, Dr. June Lee from Breast Specialists of South Florida, and Dr. Karen Koffler from the University of Miami. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Matani to start over the panel. Thanks, Dalen. Uh, and I'd like to start off by just uh, thanking the team at Total Health Conferencing. Uh, I was so happy to have this program live last year uh, I've done a lot of medical education events uh, geared towards educating physicians and the community and nationally and internationally. But last year, I decided to uh, look into our community and have an interactive event with, with patients. And it was a huge success. We had a great turnout and it was really interactive. So I have to say I was a little disappointed this year. I think we've all faced a lot of disappointments when it comes to COVID and all the things that have changed for us personally and professionally. And I'm so grateful to the team at Total Health Conferencing that you were all able to make this work for us. And I'm excited for a really interactive uh, session this afternoon with uh, some of my colleagues and then we'll be um, having a great program for the rest of the afternoon. I, I, I'm sure you all have uh, access to the agenda. So just a little bit about me. I'm a breast cancer medical oncologist at the University of Miami Sylvester Cancer Center. I've been there since 2010. I'm really committed towards medical education and also very involved in clinical research phase two and three uh, clinical trials. So excuse me, I posed this question to uh, all of the panelists and uh, I'll answer it myself. What are you looking to learn? Because I think that in this program, uh, although we're looking to educate patients, we're also looking to learn from you. So we're very interested in hearing your questions. I hope none of you will be shy. It's a virtual format. You can um, get us your questions and we'll answer them in real time. Uh, but what I'm looking to learn from the program today is I'm looking forward to an honest and open dialogue with patients regarding their fears, questions, and feedback on where we can improve. I think a lot of our patients in the clinic are, are, are nervous sometimes to ask us questions. And uh, sometimes I get that information from my PA, my nurse practitioner, or my nurse. Uh, but here's the opportunity for you all to not be shy and please ask us all the questions that maybe you're, you're not comfortable asking your own physician. And hopefully by the end of the day, you'll have strategies to be comfortable. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, not only my colleague, but a good friend, Dr. Elisa Krill Jackson. I'm blessed to work with her since um, about a year now. I think Elisa, you've been with us at UM Sylvester. Uh, she almost a year. Almost a year, um, time flies. She's originally from Cleveland, Ohio, went to Yale, uh, was an English major, and then medical school at the University of Michigan, trained at the Brigham, moved to Florida, uh, and has now uh, been with us uh, at University of Miami and actually did her training there. She's passionate about educating and advocating her pa for her patients, working as a team, and she wants, uh, her team wants the patient to understand the whys of their treatment and be part of the decision making. She feels strongly that shared decision-making will provide the best solution to maintain the patient's quality of life 
While effectively treating their disease outside of work, she loves to travel, read, and bike. I know because I biked with her in the Dolphin uh, Cycling Challenge, and uh, let's see, uh, hopefully that'll happen again next year. Uh, Elisa, I'll ask you to read us your quote about what you're hoping to get out of the program today. Well, I hope that patients learn that the treatment of breast cancer is a partnership with their doctor. Decisions need to be made together to help them live a quality of life during treatment. I think that, um, you know, most patients come in expecting to be told what to do and don't necessarily expect to be listened to. And I think that um, the best care help happens when I know what the patient's priorities are. Um, and uh, what they want and what they expect and what their values are. And we can make decisions together uh, to maintain uh, their health and quality of life. Great, thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Priyanka Grover, uh, a breast radiologist. She uh, uh, has specialized in early cancer detection and image guided procedures. She's created a space for women in Broward in the Sunrise area where medical care is high quality, personalized, and one-on-one. -on -one. Women feel nervous and scared when it comes to breast imaging. Dr. Grover takes every step to make sure her patients feel comfortable and are treated with care, love, and respect. She ensures to give the results on the same day so no one leaves with uh, any anxiety. So Priyanka, I'll ask you to read us your quote, give us a little bit of information about what you're hoping to learn today. Thank you, Rishma. Hi, everyone. I'm a breast imaging radiologist and a lot of patients come to me with questions about why we need screening mammography. So I definitely would like to learn more about their inhibitions undergoing mammography because it is a one test which can save lives. Great, thank you. Next, we're so fortunate to have on our panel, Dr. June Lee, a, a breast surgeon, a breast oncoplastic surgeon. As breast cancer is very treatable, many lives for years post-diagnosis uh, and treatment, her goal is to safely remove the tumor and do it in a cosmetically pleasing manner to allow the patients to live and looking and feeling better. She works in private practice in Lake Worth, West Palm Beach and Wellington. Uh, in the Wellington area unhindered by political pressures of different hospital systems to provide care close to where patients live, also allowing patients to receive affordable care. June, tell us what you're hoping to learn. Hello, um, good afternoon. It's, it's a real honor and pleasure to be among this esteemed panelists and to be with all of you um, ladies out there and I guess gentlemen too. Uh, virtually, um, I'm, I'm seriously, instead of, uh, you know, having patients learn about things, obviously, when they're faced with um, uh, cancer diagnosis or any sort of abnormal imaging studies, um, uh, it's basically fear. But throughout the process that I go through with them, I'm always learning so much from them. And I've been personally just blessed with so many amazing women. So I'm, I'm open to, to learning whatever there is uh, going to be happening soon in this conference. So thank you. Great. So happy to have you, June. And last but definitely not least, I, I think uh, we're so fortunate at the University of Miami to have Dr. Karen Koffler join us. Uh, patients are so interested in integrative medicine approaches and it's rare that we have an opportunity to have an expert in this field uh, guide patients in this area. She is the medical director for the soon to be built Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Miami. She's a conventionally trained physician who decided to take a different course in patient care. She wanted to understand what really led people towards a diagnosis, what in their lifestyle contributed to illness and what protected them. She wanted to understand the root of what they were experiencing beyond treating their symptoms. Her work with patients required that they both show up, meaning Dr. Koffler is fully present, open to their experience and creative in her approach so she can tailor treatment specifically to them and the patient is prepared to do things differently in order to heal, whether it's alterations in diet, attending to their reaction to stress, 
incorporating more movement, leading, leaving behind toxic situations, etc. They work as a team to charter the waters of healing together. I love your bio, Karen. This is uh, uh, something that we're we're uh, so happy to have you to answer a lot of these questions that I'm sure we'll get this afternoon. So tell us what you're expecting to learn or hoping to learn from today. Do we have you, Karen? There you go. Oh, I think you're on mute still. How about now? Great. Am I good? Okay, yep, great. Sorry good. about that. No problem. Um, so thank you. Um, nice to be with you all. I think um, what I'm most interested in hearing about is where people feel comfortable committing to making changes in their lifestyle that will fortify them, make them stronger, um, uh, make their terrain, their body less of a hospitable environment for illness and disease. So what are the specific steps people feel like they could take actually leaving this conference today? Great, thank you. We're so happy to have you. So in the next section, what we're going to do, and while, uh, while I go through my top questions that, that uh, patients ask me and then ask my uh, esteemed panelists to do the same, I want you all out there to start thinking of the questions that you want to ask us and send, a, send them through because after we get through the section, we really want to hear from you. We want to get your honest feedback uh, and questions. So let's start with the top questions that I'm asked. Um, remember, I'm a medical oncologist. I give treatments uh, that are systemic treatments, meaning they go into the whole body. They can be treatments that are IV or oral. And a lot of patients are very scared, especially of chemotherapy and toxicities of other treatment. And a question that I'm asked, it's a very common question, I'm faced with this very often, especially when so someone is starting a new treatment and they don't know what to expect is, will I be able to work through my treatment? And added to this now is the fear of COVID and how the treatment you receive may impact your risk of, of getting um, the virus. So my answer to this question in, in most cases is always, it depends on what you do for work and it depends what the treatment that you're receiving. If you're being treated with a treatment which can really drop your white blood cell count, which we know white cells help fight infection. If you're taking a very immunosuppressive therapy and you work in a field that exposes you to many people like a teacher or a bank teller, the answer may be no. But alternatively, if you're on a treatment that you really don't have to drop your count, that won't drop your counts very much, and you're in a small office at your own desk, uh, and you are in contact with a very few amount of coworkers, the answer may be yes. So it really depends on what therapy you're receiving and in what situation you're working. Other things that, of course, uh, factor in is uh, uh, how you're tolerating the treatment. So I think a lot of people, when they ask this question, they're asking about how they're going to feel. And uh, one of the things that I try to get across quite a bit uh, are gone are the days where patients are vomiting and nauseated throughout their treatment such that they're not able to go to work. We've made considerable progress, not only in the therapies that we're using to treat breast cancer, but also in our supportive treatments. And these supportive treatments allow patients to continue to feel relatively well. We can handle nausea and vomiting very well. And we also have uh, growth factor support treatments that elevate the white blood cell count and help keep it in a safe range so that you don't end up in the hospital with low blood counts and infections. So the take home message here is our supportive therapies have improved dramatically. The, the next question that I get asked quite a bit is, I just want to make sure I'm doing everything possible. Is there any other treatment I should be considering? And for me, when I hear this question, it gets to the idea that you don't know what you don't know. So I, I know patients are very interested to access additional therapies and get information. 
And the one thing that I am very clear in providing to them is reputable resources to get that information. So be careful of the internet. It can be a dangerous place. There's a lot of misinformation out there on the internet. Make sure you ask your providers about uh, reputable sources to get information about the stage of your disease, the treatment options, and what therapies you may be eligible to receive. Uh, the, other, the other thing that the internet can help quite a bit with is a list of questions that you can come prepared to have the conversation and that you can understand some of the terms that your physician is throwing out. As a medical oncologist, I try very hard to make sure I'm explaining to patients what all of these uh, treatments are and what um, the medical terminology is. Unfortunately, uh, some physicians do a better job than others in doing that. So empowering yourself with the correct information about your disease process will, make sh will, will be helpful to uh, answer this question. And the last uh, item that I would mention in terms of other treatments is clinical trials. So clinical trials can give you access to new and exciting therapies that may not be available uh, outside the context of those studies. It's important to understand what the purpose is of clinical trials, how they're designed, what your responsibilities are. And so uh, when you're at an academic institution or even a community setting where there are clinical trials, these are things that you should uh, investigate and ask your physician about. And the last question that I get asked quite a bit is about other well-meaning family and friends that are giving you advice. My neighbor told me she was on whatever drug and she had such and such side effect. Remember, we're all different, understanding that this information, of course, comes with good intentions, but recognize every case is different. Don't compare yourself with your neighbor, your friend, a family member. Uh, how you tolerate therapy may be different. Uh, be suspicious about miracle cures and therapies that um, are pushing you to taking them without conventional treatment. And I'm so glad that we have Dr. Koffler on the line to help us go through some of that information. Uh, we can use a lot of these therapies in conjunction with standard treatments and be educated and get your information from a reliable source. Um, so those are the responses to the questions that I get asked quite frequently. Dr. Krill, I'll turn it over to you and ask you to go through the questions you're uh, posed most frequently and how you respond. Hi, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I get asked a lot of questions and one of the most common is, what is the chance that, that I will be cured or how long will I live? Um, patients ask me that all the time. So what I try to do when I first meet a patient is explain to them what is, um, is this a curable cancer? So, so if we're dealing with a curable cancer, patients will still ask sometimes, how long will I live? Well, hopefully we'll cure you and you'll live as long as you would normally have lived if you didn't have the, the cancer. So what we're doing in our treatment of breast cancer after a surgery is we're usually trying to kill any microscopic cells that may be left in the body uh, that are hidden and that we can't see. And if we're successful, that patient should live as, as long as they normally would with their genes and other illnesses. Um, and um, we can give you a percentage, but of course it's either yes or no for a patient. So, so percentages may be helpful in patients who may not have curable disease, but as I tell my patients, we don't know what's gonna happen. Some people do great for long, long periods of time. And so I think we need to um, always make our preparations, but then live our lives and hope for the best. Uh, because we want to make every day worthwhile. Um, I also get asked from patients a lot how they can maintain their quality of life. And this may include their hair, sexual activity, exercise, and weight. So of course, losing hair is a big problem for a lot of patients. It makes you look or feel like a cancer patient. And I find that when women go through chemotherapy that may cause hair loss, if they don't lose their hair, the symptoms always seem much, much less to them. So I'm a very big advocate for patients um, using cold capping 
to maintain their hair during chemotherapy. Now, of course, cold capping is not perfect. People will still have some hair thinning um, much of the time. However, most patients are able to maintain enough hair that they can walk out in public and the world doesn't know that they're on chemo. They can look in the mirror and still look like themselves. And then the other side effects of chemotherapy to them often seem much, much less. So I, I think that that is important for patients. And if uh, they should ask their doctors about it, there's ways, uh, different ways to do it. There's caps that you can rent and freeze on dry ice. There are machines um, that, uh, um, give cold uh, gel around the scalp and help maintain um, somebody's hair. Now, there's a theoretical possibility that it may protect the skin on the scalp from uh, killing cancer cells, but in all the time we've been using cold caps for more than 20 years, there have really never been reports of patients who have uh, recurrences on the scalp and not other places in the body. Now, a lot of our medicines, unfortunately, can ruin sexual activity for women. And I always try to ask my patients about that because many may be shy and not want to bring up the subject. And they're having you know, significant pain with intercourse, dryness, um, and, and that can uh, affect a marriage. It can affect somebody's quality of life. And there's lots of things, non-hormonal things that we can do that are um, very helpful to maintain sexual activity. There's laser treatments of the vagina, which can improve uh, moisture and decrease pain. There's um, uh, numbing agents that can be used. There's hydrators that can be used. And sometimes even judiciously, you know, with talking about the risks and benefits, we can even discuss vaginal estrogens in somebody who um, it is um, nothing else is working. And I think that's a, a risk benefit analysis that one has to take with their doctor. But again, I think our job is to make our patient's quality of life as, as good as possible. We know that patients who exercise and eat healthy diets are able to maintain their weight better. Um, and it actually, while they're on chemotherapy, exercise helps their energy. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that was great. And I, uh, you brought up so many uh, areas that we all get asked about quite a bit. And I hope that we can circle back to some of those, especially the cold caps and talk about uh, certain types of treatment that may be uh, more effective to use cold caps than others and things of that sort. So that'll be a, a great uh, area of discussion. With that, I'll ask uh, Dr. Grover uh, about uh, the questions that she's asked more frequent, most frequently and how do you respond? Hi everyone. So being a breast imaging radiologist um, and seeing uh, mostly women, but we do see men for breast cancer screening as well sometimes, um, I get this question all the time, why do we need a mammogram? So mammogram, fortunately, we have had several new advancements in the technique we perform mammography. The mammogram is heavily regulated for radiation dose, which has significantly reduced over years when we shifted from screen film to digitized images. And now we have a great tool called 3D mammography or tomosynthesis, which lets us look through the breast tissue layer by layer. Mammography alone has several times in several publications and uh, research, study, research studies has shown to detect cancer at an earlier stage where it's much better, has much better mortality and morbidity. So mammogram is very, very useful in detecting early breast cancer, as well as some certain findings like calcifications, architectural distortion, densities, and several other things which are not easily appreciated on other tools like ultrasound, and may I say thermography. So when patients come to me and say, can I substitute my mammogram with thermogram or ultrasound? Here's what I tell them. I tell them, listen, if you want to do thermogram, that's your belief, you can go ahead and do it. But I would never substitute it for a 3D mammogram, which is the standard screening tool we have today to detect cancer at an earlier stage. Um, and the other common question I get from women is why does mammogram involve breast compression? Uh, breast compression is important because breast tissue is made of fatty tissue and fibroglandular tissue. Now, breast compression is a very important factor to improve image quality. Once we 
compress the overlying fibroglandular tissue or dense breast tissue kind of spreads out and lets us visualize or see through the breast tissue much, much better. We work with our patients very delicately and uh, gradually increasing compression. So most of them are very good about it. Some patients do complain pain and pressure and we give them time to you know, adjust to it. But it is very important. It has been proven several times that the mammogram is a very important tool to detect early breast cancer. One other question I wanted to mention is about several people asking me if mammogram uh, cause excessive radiation. And that's one topic which I like to discuss with my patients. So I usually give them an example. If you take a flight, transatlantic flight to Europe, um, the radiation dosage you're exposed to is almost similar or maybe slightly more than getting a routine mammogram. And most of them are quite surprised about it. And um, they say, we travel all the time, so we didn't know. And number two, any other radiology test, for example, anybody ends up, you know, having any issue, goes to ER, ends up having a CAT scan, or any other radiological studies, those, the radiation dose they get is much, much higher than a routine screening mammogram. Mammogram radiation dose is heavily regulated by MQSA and ACR, and we work very hard to make sure that um, the radiation dose does not exceed the standard. Thank you. Thanks, Priyanka. That's great. I, uh, I think you raised such important topics that um, hopefully, again, we can come back to. Um, June, uh, tell us about the questions that you're posed and how you respond. So if you've been on the journey through breast cancer and have met other patients, you'd realize that there's really no one set way that everyone gets treated. Uh, breast cancers are very different, even though they're all called breast cancer. Um, and thanks to the work of wonderful radiologists like Dr. McGrover, uh, most are found early and when they're so treatable and so curable. So not, even, not everybody needs even chemo, not everybody needs radiation, uh, not everybody needs their breasts, all their breasts removed. Um, so the short answer is, do I need to remove my breasts? Um, is short answer is, uh, yes and no, <laughs> uh, but through 40, 50, 60 years of research, we've learned that people do just as well removing just the disease part, not the whole breast. And because a lot of patients live, can live for many, many years, um, a big thing now is doing surgery to even out asymmetries and divots can, that can be created by lumpectomies and radiation. Uh, and these are usually done on an outpatient basis. Insurance covers most of cost of reconstruction, um, so they're very well uh, handled. Um, some people worry about anesthesia. Nowadays, no one uh, wakes up in the middle of surgery. I say pretty much everybody wakes up after surgery. Um, and with really great radiolog anesthesiologists and medications, uh, many wake up with minimal anest anesthetic com uh, complications, minimal nausea. Um, I've heard that most older patients are reluctant to go through surgery because they have heard of memory issues afterwards. But with short surgeries, like some breast surgery, which can take as, as long as 30 minutes, they wake up fine and they're driving the next day. That's great. Okay. Um, Dr. Koffler, tell us, uh... I, what what you uh, are most frequently asked, or I see you say that there are no top questions, but maybe the, the topics that are raised uh, most frequently? Sure. So I think um, uh, many of the patients that I see just generally want uh, to feel more of a sense of uh, self-efficacy and authority and a, and a sense that they are doing something, doing, taking a role in their own healing, which I really applaud. I think it's absolutely essential. Um, and so what we're often doing is examining, okay, where in your lifestyle might you be able to uh, address so that you have more vitality, so that you feel a, a greater sense of confidence that you'll do well through treatment, that you are acting preventatively, that there'll be no recurrence and so forth. 
Um, and as many folks have mentioned, you know, it has a lot to do with the day-to-day -day choices that we make. Um, our, our philosophy in the work that we do is that the body is designed to heal and it's our role to augment that capacity and eliminate those things that seem to be getting in the way of that. So toward that end and with the desire to give people more vitality and therefore less of a sense of anxiety and fear, we'll look at how are they eating? Because we feel very much that the most important thing you can do every day for your health is what you decide to put at the end of your fork. So how are you eating? What are you nourishing yourself with? Um, how are you moving? Um, you've heard already that exercise improves um, people's experience through chemotherapy. It improves virtually every issue that I see uh, in my clinic, um, whether it's cognitive issues or heart health, et cetera, arthritis. Um, uh, we talk about sleep to a large extent. Um, we want to make sure that people are getting adequate sleep because their immune system is at its maximum during deep stages of sleep. Uh, and we, we will uh, review things like supplements. Many of my folks come actually with garbage bags filled with supplements. And so we want to go through those and see what it actually is a benefit, what could be harmful, what has no value, et cetera. So um, when, when you do this sort of 360 look at your, your lifestyle and start making small changes, people do feel more agency over their health. That's wonderful. And, and I really hope that we get uh, some good questions about supplements because as a medical oncologist, you know, this is something that we even are faced with quite a bit. Patients come to us uh, with the label of what's in their supplement or a bag of something, and then they ask us uh, whether it's safe to take with their treatment. And as medical oncologists, uh, I would say we do a poor job in medical school in, in training on, on these topics. And that's why we're so fortunate to have someone like you um, at the University of Miami. But I think a lot of patients are uh, venturing into this area, whether they admit it to us or not, they are interested, they're using these, um, these supplements. So it, it's important for us to know what they're taking and what uh, are the benefits and the risks. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can go into the question and answer session. Again, I'm going to encourage all of you that are out there tuning in to not be shy, ask us your questions. And to get us started, I think we've gotten a couple that have come through uh, the chat. And the first one is to Dr. Koffler. Uh, what is your take on metastatic breast cancer patients taking collagen to heal the body at the cellular level? What interactions or side effects can be expected while on Ibrams and Arimidex? So I think those are two different questions. The second one, we, uh, Lisa and I can take but I'll ask you to take the one on collagen. So uh, specific for breast cancer, um, I don't know of any data to support the use of collagen in metastatic breast cancer. Um, in addition, very high doses of collagen actually can get converted to something called oxalates, which can create um, in certain patients pain as well as can contribute to anxiety. Um, having said that, I would say in general, many, many, many of my patients are taking collagen for hair, skin, and nails, and possibly cartilage uh, benefits. And we do see some in those, uh, in, those, in those tissues, but for metastatic breast cancer, I know of no data. Thank you. So, uh I'll, I'll take the question on, on Ibrance and, and Arimidex. So Ibrance or Pavlocyclin uh, is a newer type of therapy. It's been approved since 2015 for stage four metastatic breast cancer patients. And this therapy, when combined with hormonal therapy like anastrozole or Arimidex, has shown remarkable improvements 
Uh, these drugs allow patients to have their disease controlled for a longer period of time. And in some studies with other CDK4-6 inhibitors, especially there have been benefits shown in overall survival, meaning patients actually live longer. Uh, that being said, there are toxicities to this therapy. Ibrance is a drug that can lower your white blood cell count. And we know white blood cells help fight infection. Uh, the risk of having a fever and ending up with a low white count and being hospitalized is actually very low with this drug. Uh, it's less than 2%. And so on the whole, there, are, uh, there is the need for monitoring while you're on this therapy. You need your white blood cell count checked a little more frequently in the beginning. Uh, there are other side effects, like it can increase the risks of um, uh, hair thinning, not complete hair loss. Uh, some patients have some fatigue, some diarrhea, but the main side effect is really lowering your white blood cell count. And with an astrozole or a Rimidex, the aromatase inhibitors, we know that these drugs can weaken bone density, uh, so that's something that should be followed. And then many patients do experience some side effects with joint pain. Uh, these tend to get better with time, but for some patients, it becomes a huge issue. Um, the next question is also actually a medical oncology question, uh, and I know, Elisa, because you discussed a bit about cold caps, uh, there is a question regarding insurance coverage. Uh, so what has been your experience uh, with uh, cold caps and insurance coverage? Unfortunately, I don't think any insurers right now, uh, any of the standard insurers, are paying for cold capping, and, and yes, it can get quite costly. So. Um, this is this is really a cash uh, business at this point for cold capping, which I think is really tragic because um, uh, people who have health insurance, there, there aren't haves and have nots. Um, everybody can get the same therapy if they have uh, insurance, but only people who can afford it can do cold capping. There are some charities available. There's a charity called Hair to Stay that uh, gives a maximum benefit of $1,000, um, which would not pay for a full course of cold capping on any of our standard uh, regimens. Um, I do know of some private charities that um, some of my patients have taken advantage of to allow them to cold cap. And I think that, um, you know, we need to uh, pursue charitable uh, contributions for our patients because I, I truly believe the patients feel physically better when they look like themselves. Uh, and it's not for everybody. It's, it's, um, you know, it's uncomfortable to do cold capping and then for some people it's not worth the hassle, but for people who are willing to do it, I think it makes them feel better. So I would say, talk to your doctor, research charitable options. There are ways to get it if you want to do it. So an add on to that would be uh, someone who uh, uh, wrote in a question about any relationship with cold capping and brain cancer. So the skull is very thick. So um, remember, we uh, uh, cold capping is not 100% successful in even rescuing the health of the hair follicles in the scalp. Um, and let alone there's tissue beneath the skin and the hair follicles, and then there's a whole thick layer of skull, and then there's fluid between that and the brain. So there is absolutely no um, increased risk of, um, of brain metastases with cold capping. Yeah, and then the last point that I'll just add on to that in terms of cold capping is that there are certain chemotherapy regimens where cold caps can be very effective and certain uh, therapies where it may not be as effective. For example, drugs like adriamycin, uh, the effects of uh, or the benefits of cold caps um, are, are not demonstrated at a high, high frequency. So these are all discussions to have with your physician. Um, one thing that comes up not very often, but uh, it does happen. And as we focus on this group today, I, it's interesting our whole panel is women. I suspect that many of the participants that are dialed in are women, but it's something that's forgotten. Men can get breast cancer too. 
So Dr. Grover, I'll ask you, um, especially because you brought this up in terms of screening, uh, give us a little blurb, uh, your little blurb about uh, uh, men and breast cancer and, and tell us uh, some things that you think that patients should know. Sure, thank you, Rachel. So I get this not very often, but I do have men coming to us for um, screening or diagnosis uh, when they feel a lump or pain or discomfort. Not many people talk about it, but one in 1,000 men in the United States do get breast cancer. And more, more often it happens that they have either enlargement of the breast, which is also known as gynecomastia. Um, so since men don't really pay attention, I'm not generalizing, but that's more common to, to, to this topic, it falls upon their wives, sisters, girlfriends, partners, and all to take care of the fact, to educate them as well. And obviously there are many men who are aware and participant in the information exchange. If a man who's complaining of pain, lump, new swelling, uh, nipple changes, any discharge, any skin changes around the nipple, it is important to get checked. Obviously, self breast exam is the first thing. Second thing is to proceed with a mammogram. Yes, we do do a mammogram in men. Um, and then breast ultrasound is very important too. If we find an abnormality, the patient may need a biopsy, which is more of a gold standard definitive technique to detect the type of cells which are in the area of lumbar concern. And if it is cancer, yes, they would need further surgical or oncology treatment. So it's very important for um, men to be aware of it and their family members to be aware of it that breast cancer does affect men. In addition to that, um, sometimes it could be genetically related that if they have a family history of BRCA gene mutation or in general just family history without a specific genetic mutation, they may be more prone or predisposed to developing this type of cancer. There are some other risk factors which may cause development of breast cancer in men as well. Um, so knowledge is important. Um, one more question I wanted to say is, um, no, no, not many people talk about it, but transgender population, depending on what type of hormones they take and what type of surgery they had, they may require screening or diagnosis for breast cancer too. They also develop breast cancer. Um, transgender initially who was a uh, male and has been converted to a female may have taken um, hormones. And if somebody who has taken more than five years of hormone, we do recommend um, screening. Uh, this is a topic which is not really touched very often. And um, transgender female who has converted to a male may or may not have breast surgery. If they're using, you know, um, minimizer or banding technique. They still have breast tissue. They still need to undergo screening and they still need to undergo diagnosis and preventive measurement. Thank you for bringing up those topics. I think that uh, those are two areas that don't get discussed enough. Um, one, one other topic that I'll raise that came through on, on a, a different chat uh, regarding questions that are uh, frequently um, asked is something for you, June. And I think this is something that we all see as patients are very anxious. They get diagnosed with a cancer in one breast and then they're sent for additional imaging and sometimes it includes an MRI and then they're told that they need a biopsy in the other breast and there's this anxiety surrounding uh, the, the uh, diagnosis and getting to the operating room very quickly and some women just go to, that's it, just remove them both. I, I don't uh, want to go through a lumpectomy. I want a bilateral mastectomy. So the question that was raised is, um, in your opinion, is it better to get a double mastectomy so the other breast doesn't uh, get involved uh, in the future? I think, June, you're on mute. That's the quote of the year with uh, COVID <laughs> and Zoom. You're on mute. <laughs> you're on mute. Yeah. I was very nervous about this because I'm like, oh my gosh, something's going to mess. I'm going to mess up something. Um, I'm a technophile, a technophobe. So um, that's a very loaded question. Do I need a mastectomy? So I kind of touched on that. Um, so it really depends on your age, how many more years you have until this comes back and is it gonna come back? And it also has to do with the type of cancer and there's so many different types, even in breast cancer. Um, your genetic status, 
uh, your family history. Um, so having a bilateral mastectomy is, um, is a big deal. Um, nowadays, they've you know, gotten it into science. You have mastectomy, probably uh, reconstruction. You're out the next day. Three months later, you go through reconstruction. But you know, not everything is, um, everything's got its benefits and risks. Um, so it really, um, a lot of people do have a lot of fear of it coming back. But in general, breast cancer, um, with all the advances in therapy, um, kind of doesn't come back as often as we think they would. Um, so that's one thing I would like to say. Uh, with the so much research that's happened, um, there are new medicines coming out every year. Um, just this past year, something came up, and Dr. Mitani and Dr. Jackson would, would attest to that. But um, so lives are getting prolonged. We're doing everything possible so that you don't get it back. Um, so I would say it's a discussion that you and your doctor should have. Um, and understanding the risks and benefits of doing bilateral mastectomy, um, it's it's a it's a big topic of conversation, and not something that I would say yes or no to. Um, so, uh, it it but in general, if you were really young in your twenties or thirties with breast cancer um, and have a genetic mutation that puts your lifetime risk of having the second or even third breast cancers uh, in a, in a uh, that, would, uh, that would kind of raise my um, interest in having that conversation with the patient more than if you're older um, and you have a very sort of nice type of breast cancer that you know, doesn't really need that much um, in terms of adjuvant therapy and things like that. Um, I'd actually like to make a comment because I think a lot of my patients also ask um, about bilateral mastectomy if they see me, you know, before surgery. And, and I think there's a lot of misperception about what their risk is of having a second breast cancer. So a mastectomy will not affect the risk that the cancer will spread. And I think that's a big misconception that patients have. What the risk is that a, pa that a cancer will spread to other parts of the body really has to do with whether there are already microscopic cells in parts of the body at the time of your original diagnosis. The question with a, a mastectomy or bilateral mastectomy is to prevent new cancers in the future. And I think for somebody with like a BRCA mutation, we know their risk for a second cancer in their lifetime, depending on their age, could be up to 60%. But for a standard patient who has an estrogen sensitive cancer, who's going to take hormonal therapy, their risk for a second cancer in their lifetime may be the same as their risk of anybody in this country having a first cancer because hormonal therapy will reduce their risk. So I think, um, I think it behooves us to you know, take a step back before we rush into bilateral mastectomy and make sure our patients understand what the purpose of bilateral mastectomy is and what it will or will not do for their health and uh, longevity. In general, it will not affect their longevity. It will not affect their risk of metastatic disease. It will only affect whether they need to have um, mammograms in the future and what their risk is of another cancer in the future. I think you raise a very important point in understanding when you decide to pursue an intervention, what is the goal of that intervention and what are your expectations? Uh, so the topics that you brought up are really important. We used to quote patients in the old days that if you have a cancer in one breast, your risk is 1% per year for the other breast, but we know now that that information is outdated and uh, the risk is much lower than that. So in the absence of having a uh, genetic mutation like BRCA uh, going through these procedures that can sometimes be over treatment um, is, is not recommended, but that is not to say that there aren't other decisions that factor in like were raised, uh, the need for additional breast monitoring and how you feel about doing that. Uh, it becomes quite traumatic when you go through a breast cancer diagnosis. And for some women, they just don't want to have to deal with breast cancer screening. And it's, it's almost like a PTSD. So the, deci the decision is an individual one, uh, but you need to make it with accurate information.
information. So the next question uh, that came through the chat is actually from a patient of Dr. Jack, uh, Krill Jackson's, who's um, not surprisingly singing her praises uh, about how well she's being taken care of. Uh, and she says that she's, uh, her patient, she has had a complete response to treatment. She had stage two, her two positive breast cancer. She's worried about the risk of recurrence and she's very focused on steps she can take to improve her odds. Since her diagnosis, she's switched to a completely uh, vegetarian vegan diet and she's interested in the research like the China study that has pointed to the fact that animal products can be a root of cancer and numerous autoimmune diseases. Karen, I'll ask you to take this one. Yeah, so the diet question, um, we get that an awful lot. So I'll, I'll just say my bias about diets in general, and then we can drill down a little bit more. Um, because we do see so many diets out there, right? So there's paleo and keto and Pegan and South Beach, and the list goes on and on and on. And I think if you look at the way we are designed as humans, we have both canines and molars. Herbivores, plant only animals have just molars. Carnivores have just canines. So we're a mix of those two. And the same is true of our gut length. So herbivores have a very long gut length because they have to break through fiber to get at nutrients. So a giraffe has an extremely long gut as opposed to a lion, which has a very short gut. And we are somewhere in between. So I think it is natural for us to be omnivorous, meaning eating both plants and animals. And by the way, I happen to be a vegetarian. Having said that, I think part of the problem is our food sources today are not what they've been historically. I think unless you are extremely uh, vigilant, it is difficult to get really optimal beef, fish, chicken all the time. And so our, it's really more of an issue of what we've done to our planet, quite frankly, and our farming methods that has made our meat, because animals eat other animals or eat other things and concentrate toxins. We are at the top of the food chain. We concentrate it further. Now, if one is on a vegan or vegetarian diet, we have to, be, uh, we have to watch for particularly B vitamin deficiencies and also just how you feel. So I've had plenty of vegetarians add back meat in their diet and feel like they wish they had done that 10 years earlier. I've had meat eaters give up meat and become vegetarians and feel so much better. So I think people have to find their diet. Um, now having said all of that, by far and away, the, the greatest amount of nutritional benefit that we can reap comes out of the plant kingdom. So it, just in terms of breast cancer, Cruciferous vegetables are loaded with compounds that allow the liver to detoxify estrogen, pesticides, and lots of other chemicals. So we really emphasize the cruciferous vegetable family. Things like green tea, which is super rich in polyphenols that, is, that are protective against all kinds of cancers, we know, uh, is another great thing to be able to add in. Ground flax. So the list goes on and on, curcumin, my, uh, mushrooms, particularly shiitake mushrooms, um, all are, are uh, affording us nutrients that protect us from, from cancer and frankly, lots of other uh, health issues. So uh, I would say as a vegetarian, you're doing your, now, mind you, there are Kraft sort of macaroni and cheese vegetarians uh, you know, you know, a lot of bread eating, rice based vegetarians, and then there are vegetarians that really concentrate on nuts, seeds, fruits, and vegetables. And so that's I sort of would push people more in that direction. Um, I also think that if you're a vegetarian, you have to work a little bit harder to get omega three uh, oils, which are very important in, in the setting of breast cancer because probably our richest so sources, salmon, sardines, trout, herring, mackerel, uh, would be out of your diet. So you'd have to really concentrate more on nuts and seeds and supplement. Thank you, thank you. So I'm going to shift us back for a moment to 
uh, screening. And I'll just uh, say as a reminder, none of the recommendations or discussions we're having today is intended to replace any advice from your physician uh, regarding your specific case. So with that being said, I'm gonna read this question uh, with that caveat um, uh, and try to convert this to a more general question. Uh, my mammogram in January 2016 missed a two centimeter tumor in the breast and a four centimeter tumor in the lymph node. Uh, I found it in April 2016 on my own. Since diagnosis and treatment, I do ultrasounds every six months to detect recurrence. I have implants. Am I missing something by not doing mammograms and having ultrasounds instead? So Dr. Grover, I'll ask you again, as we try to convert this question to a more general question, uh, what is the benefit of ultrasounds in women uh, who are, uh, haven't gone through surgery and mastectomy and implant? And then what is the benefit of an ultrasound in this situation? Sounds like she had a mastectomy and had an implant and is now being monitored with ultrasounds. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Mahathani, again. Um, so two things, that, there, there are actually two questions in this question. First question, um, in young women with dense breast tissue, first of all, state of Florida mandates that we let women know that they have dense breast tissue. The importance of letting women know that they have dense breast is because sometimes heterogeneously dense breast or extremely dense breast tissue may hide small masses. Um, and the combination of mammogram and ultrasound is much more sensitive. Um, than mammogram alone in younger women in their 40s or late 30s or early 50s or women who have dense breasts, which could be even older too. So having a combination of mammogram, 3D mammogram and ultrasound is much, much more sensitive and accurate in terms of diagnosis or screening for breast cancer. And I recommend that to most of most of my, my patients who uh, come in for screening. Um, so the patient who brought this point up that the mammogram missed a cancer, um, I'll be honest that with 2D mammography, there it's 90% sensitive. So there is a 10% chance that it may not be able to see a small mass in which may be hidden by underlying or overlying dense breast tissue. Combination of mammogram and ultrasound would have helped. I would never recommend substituting mammogram with an ultrasound because in that situation, there are several things which we see on mammogram alone, as I mentioned, like calcifications, architectural distortion, some sort of specific focal asymmetry, some specific findings which cannot be picked up on ultrasound alone. Um, so combination of mammogram and ultrasound is much, much more helpful. Um, and number two, now answering the question about screening mammogram or MRI in women who have undergone mastectomy. Now, mastect there are no guidelines or medically supported me or medical data which supports screening mammogram in women who have undergone mastectomy. It's more of a clinically driven um, scenario where if a woman who has undergone mastectomy and reconstruction, be it implants or be it flap reconstruction, they perform self breast exam and clinical exams. If they feel a lump, or they feel a mass or a new finding, absolutely, they come to us for ultrasound and mammogram. A lot of times it's just post-surgical fat necrosis or post-surgical changes, but sometimes we do find that in the lump after mastectomy or after reconstruction could be a recurrent tumor. Um, some surgeons prefer to have, after mastectomy, prefer to have a baseline mammogram or a baseline MRI just so that in future, if there's a question, they can always go back to the baseline and compare, but they do not necessarily need to have routine annual mammography or MRIs unless there's a new clinical concern. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, in-depth response. I think these are questions that uh, we get asked quite a bit and it's helpful to go through that information because patients become very confused, uh, especially as they talk to their friends and family who may have gone through the diagnosis and, and are uh, going through a different uh, sort of screening. So as you point out, all of these recommendations have to be individualized. Elisa, I think we got you back. Yeah, good, we did. We lost you, you're on mute. But um, I one of the questions that came through on the other chat, I have to say is uh, something that really is so important because it gets to the balance of risk and benefit of our treatments. Uh, and it's, it's so uh, appropriately or nicely worded too. 
Are the recommended treatments worse than the cancer itself? I was told that most of the time the cancer is far worse, but then it was explained to me that after my first two or three treatments that may say, seem horrible, I'll probably want to quit because the treatment is worse than the disease itself. But then maybe after that, things will get better. So the feel that I'm getting from this question is, again, balancing the risks and benefits of our treatment. And of course, we don't know this person what exact treatment they're going through. But on a broader level, I'll ask you, how do you approach these uh, discussions with your patients? So again, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think this is a partnership. And I need to know what people's priorities are. Um, I always tell my patients, and I'm assuming this patient has um, not curable disease, because I think we need to make a distinction. When we're treating somebody with potentially curable disease, so we're talking about um, a, a rigorous chemotherapy regimen that's self-limited in time. So you're going to have chemo for four months and then, then we're done. Um, and hopefully you will never need chemotherapy again. And you might have to take some pill with side effects, but we'll work on the side effects. But in somebody with a metastatic disease, what we're trying to do is we are trying to um, uh, keep the disease at bay to lengthen their lifespan and to maintain their quality of life. And I think that is the key point. Is, is to maintain quality of life. And um, you know, many, many years ago, we used to give very, very uh, toxic chemotherapies to patients with, with advanced disease. Um, and now we've sort of pulled back and generally give one drug at a time and try to make it tolerable. And I think you need to work with your oncologist to, um, to make sure that the treatments are given in a way which is tolerable. I have patients who I've had a patient right now I'm thinking of who has been fighting uh, metastatic breast cancer for I think 14 years now, which is a long time. And we've done one treatment after another. And I think it has been very rare where she feels that the side effects of the treatment are, are worse than the disease itself. Um, so again, there's always ways that we can change our regimens, the timing of the regimens, um, um, the dose of the regimens to maintain quality of life and efficacy of the treatment as, as much as possible. So again, this is a conversation. It is a partnership. And, um, and as I always tell my patients, I'm going to work around you. I don't want you not to visit family and friends. I don't want you to travel, although right now nobody's traveling. Um, but I want you to do the things that make your life um, have great quality. And we will work around that to keep you as healthy as possible. Great. Thank you. Um, Karen, this is a question for you. And it speaks to the, the overwhelming amount of information that is out there and how patients can get to accurate information. There are so many um, pieces of advice that are coming to them uh, from all directions. This person writes, my diet is pretty bad. I like sugar. I love the honesty. <laughs> I like sugar and I let myself eat whatever I want. If I absolutely had to change, I would do it. When I was on chemo, food was not much of a pleasure. I don't want to be foolish and sacrifice my health. What do I need to do with need being capitalized? Okay, so uh, to normalize the sugar piece, uh, because that's a fairly ubiquitous issue, um, realize this, you know, when we come into the world the first thing we taste is breast milk, and it's predominantly a carb. It's sweet. So it's natural for us to want sweets. If you feed, if you give monkeys a choice of an unripe banana or a ripe banana, which has a higher sugar content, they will always choose the riper banana. So the desire for sweets is not unnatural. What has happened, though, to our sweet, uh, selection, let's say, is that it's like on steroids. It is sugar on steroids. So 
many of us can no longer taste the sweetness of a strawberry because we've trained our taste buds to really want a lot more sugar. Um, and the good news is you can untrain your taste buds. It takes about two weeks to really cut back on sugar and you will begin to be intolerant of sweets that you used to really like. And to be honest with you, the question about need of all the things one can do to take care of their health. I would say the single biggest thing, as I said before, is diet. But when it comes to sugar, that fuels almost every problem that I see in my clinic, not just diabetes, which we all know about, that, inf that fuels cognitive impairment, that fuels heart disease, that fuels uh, fatty liver, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. So, so one is sort of learning what your triggers are that, that w makes you resort to perhaps soothing yourself using food. So it's an inappropriate use of food, right? Because food should nourish us. Food should vitalize us. And if it's stealing from our health, it's the wrong kind of food. And so you've got to recognize that we've been indoctrinated through our food supply, honestly, to want food, to crave food. And by the way, I'm on the listserv of many of the food manufacturers, and I can see how crafty they are in designing the shape, the flavor, the crunchiness. They, they attend to every detail and then they test us to see what we'll respond to. So you have to remember, you know, we've been groomed to want food that isn't good for us. Um, so pulling it back in, it's a, it's a mind, one is a mindset of deciding what matters to you more. What really matters to you more? Does your health, does your well-being, does your vitality matter to you more? Or does this brief momentary pleasure matter to you more? Especially if that brief momentary pleasure becomes your diet. And I am not opposed. You know, I will not go to a wedding and refuse the cake because I'm on this strict diet. You know, there's festive fare and there's daily fare. And daily fare really should be actual food that our great grandparents would have perhaps eaten. And festive fare is those occasional uh, departures from what's really good for us. Um, so I would say the number one thing to address would really be the story that one has created around their need for sweets. Because it's a story, right? It's just a story that we craft. Um, if you were on a desert island and you had no sweets, you wouldn't die. So <laughs> we can retrain ourselves into relating to food so that it does nour actually nourish us at the deepest level as opposed to secretly stealing our health and well-being. Wow, that's really motivating for all of us and makes us rethink some of our choices. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. Wait, I just want to say... You know, I do love, I understand what this writer is, is talking about. I enjoy chocolate-covered almonds. I mean, that's something I really enjoy, but I don't have to, you know, I've trained myself. And by the way, I got into medical school, th school through the M&M Mars Company because I sat with a bag of peanut M&Ms to study hour after hour after hour. So I appreciate <laughs> their orientation, but at a certain moment... <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love. I love it. Okay, June. I, I want to ask you a question that I think um, a lot of our patients uh, don't have the most accurate information on before uh, as they go through in years after surgery. Uh, you talked a bit about how breast cancer surgery is peeled back. So gone are the days of the radical that rad radical mastectomy, uh, then we've gone to lumpectomy, we've started going away from axillary lymph node dissections to sentinel nodes, but there are still patients that are at risk for uh, um, side effects after our surgical procedures, specifically lymphedema. And I get, as a medical oncologist, many patients who come into the office and haven't been properly educated about this side effect of lymphedema uh, so can you talk to us a little bit about it? What is the risk of lymphedema with an axillary node dissection versus a sentinel node? When should, be there, when should they be wearing their sleeves? 
um, what can they do to decrease their risk of lymphedema, those sorts of uh, questions, if you could address. It's, um, lymphedema is a, a problem that's, um, that fortunately not too many people face anymore because we've cut down on uh, how aggressive we are with the axillary surgeries. Um, and the number one risk for lymphedema is really how many nodes you take out, how aggressive we are. And unfortunately, sometimes we do have to still do that, especially when there's disease left after a neoadjuvant treatment um, and there's still bulky disease left. Um, so number one risk factor is surgery, level of surgery. Uh, the number two risk factor for breast uh, lymphedema is radiation. And some people still have to um, undergo that. Um, and there's stuff that we can do to kind of um, uh, lessen that chance of that happening if you have to go under uh, those procedures. Um, and there are exercises, arm strengthening exercises, uh, weight loss, but obviously if you have to have surgery next week, um, you know. But in general, um, I try to kind of cancel my patients who are, who may have to have axillary surgery and radiation is, um, I send them to a lymphedema clinic, a physical therapist, so they can kind of learn what they can do. There's some massages that, um, that you can do so they understand. But um, I would say the number, the third risk uh, is um, obesity. Um, so kind of going with Dr. Koffler's uh, line of reasoning, which I really, really, really enjoyed, um, is really trying to, you know, maintain good health um, and uh, decreasing sugar intake as much as possible. Um, fourth risk, I would say, and it's really down the list, you know, it, it's, it's really number one is surgery up here. Um, radiation, and then down there, maybe obesity, but way down there is maybe infection. And I know that nursing 101 tenant is still, if you had axillary surgery, uh, you don't do any IVs or blood pressures, and that's not necessarily um, the case anymore. Um, but, and, and if you've just had like one or two lymph nodes removed during uh, sentinel lymph node surgery, I would quote like less than 1% of lymphedema. Um, so so uh, I would say um, uh, number four or five uh, in the list of risk factors for lymphedema is infection of the arm that might kind of um, but lymphedema, it can happen anytime right after surgery, radiation to about five years, would say, is the highest risk of um, lymphedema occurrence. But uh, the best thing is to, um, you know, uh, there, there's <laughs> that we can do as patients, right, is to really work on exercising and, uh, and cutting down sugar intake um, to really moderate your, your weight. Thanks, June. Uh, Elisa, I'll ask you this question. I'm curious to see how you respond because I think as medical oncologists, this is probably, as I'm reading this question, I'm thinking I should have put this on my top three questions. Why are you not doing PET scans to follow me after my cancer diagnosis? Uh, what's so dangerous about it? Don't you want to know? Uh, that, it, that my cancer has come back? That's a question I get asked very frequently. How do you respond? What a loaded question and what a hard question to answer. But I actually want to thank- That's why I'm asking you instead of answering them. <laughs> I, I want to thank June for actually bringing up the point first about using the arm that you've had axillary surgery on. I think we, we have to retrain all of our nurses and everything not to tell patients this. Um, because I think it, it, um, it makes things difficult for patients in the future and unnecessarily so. I think with, with care and good technique, people can get blood pressures and IVs on the arms that they had axillary surgery on. Um, in terms of PET scans, I try to explain to patients that the therapy that we give after surgery is meant to kill any microscopic cells. 
if those cells come back um, and grow to a point that we can see them on a scan um, or feel them or have symptoms from them, it's, it's, we, that is metastatic breast cancer that unfortunately with the therapies we have currently, we can rarely cure. And unfortunately, a PET scan won't find anything until it's a half a centimeter or a centimeter in size. Um, they've done studies which have compared people who have gone, who have had routine scanning after a diagnosis of breast cancer and compared them to people who uh, did not have routine scanning. And what they found was even in the group that had scanning done, the cancers were mostly detected, 80% or 90% were detected because people came in and said, I have a pain, I have a cough, I have this symptom. So the, the scans really weren't detecting anything early. And a PET scan, unfortunately, gives an awful lot of radiation as, a composed, as opposed to what a mammogram gives. A PET scan, and Dr. Grover can, can, can give me the actual doses, but a PET scan is hundreds of thousands of times more. And we know that repetitive um, high dose uh, um, radiology scans can actually increase the risk for other cancers. So I, although it's, it's, it's a happy thing when somebody gets a scan and they see that they're fine, um, what I tell my patients is if you're not having symptoms, it is unlikely we are going to find anything on a scan and it just adds expense and risk and radiation to you. Yeah, I think those are all great responses. And the other thing that I try to educate my patients on is when are they at risk? So different subtypes of breast cancer place you at risk of recurrence at different time points. For an estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative uh, breast cancer, one of the peak time points is around year seven or eight, but you can have distant recurrences 10 or 15 years later. And so how long are we gonna be putting you through these radiology scans and what risk are you assuming by taking all that uh, radiation for those scans? Uh, in other subtypes of breast cancer, like triple negative, where the cancers, if they're going to come back, tend to come back earlier, it may be useful to try to do some screening imaging, but insurance companies rarely pay for it in the absence of uh, symptoms for a lot of the reasons that uh, Dr. Krill brought up. I think we have a few more minutes for a couple last questions uh, before we close out the session. Uh, this last one, I'll, uh, I think Dr. Grover kind of touched on it, but I'll, I'll just read it and you can see if there's anything to add. Um, when you have a mammogram done, should the mammogram be read as, uh, should the mammogram report read BIRAD zero if they want you to have an ultrasound as well, or should you automatically have both done? So repeat your question again. Yeah, I was a little confused by it as well. Uh, when you have a mammogram done, should the mammogram report read BIRAD zero, or if they want you to have an ultrasound as well, should you automatically have both done? So I guess maybe you can start by just explaining when we say BIRAD zero, one, two, what is that? Sure, is this a patient asking or another physician colleague? Okay. Yeah. so. So yes, it's a very good question. So we have BIRADS, which is a standardization reporting system for breast imaging. Um, BIRADS zero means there's something incomplete. We are lacking information. We need to investigate further. We need more testing or more additional evaluation. One and two means negative and benign, which is, means that just one year follow-up or appropriate clinical follow-up is advised. Three means that it's probably benign. I'm not a big fan of word probably because it throws off my patients, throws off clinicians, throws off whoever reads the report. If I had any say, I would change the word probably because it doesn't give a definitive confidence to the report and our clinical or radiological judgment. But as of now, we use BIRES 3 as probably benign, which means it needs a short-term follow-up, which could be anywhere ranging from three months up to six months. Um, and BIRES 4 and 5 mean that it requires tissue sampling, additional information, biopsy. Um, and BIRES 6 means that patient already has a biopsy-proven malignancy or a known malignancy. So going back to the question, if I have a patient who has, who has a mammogram, 
and shows an abnormality. So my BIRADS category will be BIRADS zero, needs additional testing, needs additional evaluation, may need prior images, etc. If a patient has a normal mammogram and based on the fact that she has either family history and I'm recommending MRI or she has dense breast and I'm recommending an ultrasound, I would call it BIRADS 1 or BIRADS 2 and then make the recommendation that given the fact that you have this, you need MRI or ultrasound. Thank you, Priyanka. And that is a great end to our session. Uh, the hour and 20 minutes just flew by. I really look forward to a time where we can see you all in person, hopefully next year. So stay tuned. Please keep in touch with the, total, the team at Total Health, which um, uh, will help you uh, be in the know as soon as we know about next year. Uh, Dalen or Reina, one of you, I'll ask you to come on and, and give us some information about the rest of the afternoon. Yeah, I'm so sorry to break up this great discussion. It was like so wonderful and um, really what great topics. It was so impactful. Um, so we'll, we'll take a little bit of break and then we'll come back on for the next sessions. But we will have the speakers come in and answer any of the questions that we did miss during this talk. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and we'll see you real soon.